Okay. Wonderful. Well, we have another exciting talk for you uh, next uh, from Nathan Eagle. Nathan Eagle is the CEO of Jana, a company that provides people in emerging markets with free mobile phone airtime in exchange for completing surveys. He's also an adjunct assistant professor at Harvard and a research assistant professor at Northeastern. His research involves engineering computational tools designed to explore how petabytes of human behavioral data, so similar to what we've been hearing, generated every day can be used for social good. He got his PhD from MIT in, uh, on re reality mining and was declared one of the 10 technologies most likely to change the way we live by MIT Technology Review. He was recently named one of the mo world's top mobile phone developers by Nokia and also elected to the TR35. His academic work has been published extensively, including science, PNAS, nature, all over the place. So it's really a delight to, to introduce Nathan. It's a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, you know, when we're talking about data, you know, this massive amounts of data, um, whether it's coming from Facebook or, or billboards, um, you know, one of the things that I think tends to, to, to get overlooked to some degree is that um, the majority of this data, the majority of the data that's, that's left in the wake of everyday human behavior, um, it's not being generated by people in this country. Right? It's not being generated by people in Western Europe. The majority of big data uh, is, is coming from the developing world. Um, regions that, that ultimately are underserved and understudied and and where ultimately, you know, they, they need the help the most, where they don't necessarily have a traditional uh, urban planning department or a disease surveillance um, center. Um, so I think, you know, what I try to do with my work is, is to start looking at these opportunities that are um, becoming, you know, becoming increasingly, uh, you know, abundant uh, about data, uh, but, but specifically looking at, at where we can start figuring out ways that we can leverage this data that's being generated by, you know, these billions of people, um, ultimately to improve those, those people's lives and, and, and the societies in which they live. And, um, you know, for this talk, I, I think there's, there, you know, it's really, ex you know, I love talking about the opportunities and I love getting excited about, you know, what I think the potential is because the potential really is profound. I mean, we can, there's gonna, this, this space is gonna explode and it's really exciting to start seeing it happen. Um, but what I find that, um, you know, these types of, of, of conferences uh, tend not to emphasize as much is on the failures. Um, and so, um, so for most, or at least a large fraction of this talk, I'm going to talk about, um, you know, ways I've tried to use data um, in uh, health-related settings and, and where these, these projects have been absolute failures. Um, and then hopefully conclude with, uh, with some lessons that, that we can take from, uh, from the, uh, the multiple ways I fail. All right. So um, just to give a quick overview about, about mobile phones, um, you know, so I tend to, you know, I tend to perhaps um, go big on the fact that just, you know, mobile phone is it's inherently a developing world technology, right? I mean, of the 6 billion mobile phone subscribers on the planet today, you know, almost 5 billion are in the developing world. You know, um, I mean, if you look at right now, uh, Indonesia, right? You've got uh, you've got 90% penetration. Vietnam has more phones than people, right? You know you've got over 90% penetration in Egypt and Colombia. Um, in two years in China, there's going to be 1.3 billion mobile phone subscribers. And the kicker here is that in in these two years, 900 million people in China are going to be surfing the web on their phone. I mean, this is extraordinary uh, in terms of mechanisms for delivering content and ultimately getting data back um, from, uh, from, from populations that, that, you know, until very recently, you know, have, have been, you know, to some degree we've been in the dark about. Um, now, transitioning into from phones to, uh, to Facebook, um, one of the exciting things well, that, that I find is that um, as mobile phones and now increasingly the Internet becomes more and more penetrated into these markets. Um, what's striking is that Facebook has become almost synonymous with internet, right? So I mean, if you ask the Chinese, or ask the, uh, the, the, the government of the Philippines, how many uh, people have, have, have you know, how many of their citizens have ever touched the internet? They, they say it's, it's 30 million. Um, today, there's over 27 million active Facebook users in the Philippines. 
right? So as people are touching the internet, like they are, they are, they are going after and, and basically inter being introduced by Facebook. And this is no accident. You know, Facebook has done something brilliant that I think you know not many people know about. Um, they've done deals with mobile operators, and they've gotten what's called a zero-rated um, domain, meaning um, what they what these mobile operators want to do is get people. Uh, to start using the internet because the model is you pay per byte. You know, all, the, all of these markets, it's prepaid. Um, and so what Facebook has told these operators is that, look, the way to get people to start using the internet is to give away Facebook for free. You know, that is the way you can start getting the next billion people to get online. And, uh, and, and the operators bought it, and I think it's true. And, and so now, the, you know, you're seeing people basically for the first time when they touch, when they touch the internet, they, they're signing up for Facebook. Right, so and, and you know when these things happen, it, it happens really fast. You know, um, six months ago, Facebook penetration in Vietnam was at five percent. Um, over the last six months, it's gone up to fifteen percent. Right, so it's tripled. Um, uh, you know, Facebook is illegal in Vietnam, uh, and you know what you wouldn't know if you look at the uh, the Facebook page of the of uh, Vietnam's uh, minister of telco. Who, uh, but uh, <laughs> I mean, it's it really is something that it's it's the you know this wasn't true. 18 months ago, but, but Facebook has just, they've turned a switch. And, um, and again, just like mobile phones today are a developing world technology, by 2014, uh, Facebook is, will be a developing world technology. M the majority of Facebook users are going to be in the developing world. And it's, it's something just to think about because, again, this is, this, this is um, providing, I think, really unprecedented access to, uh, to populations that, uh, that, that really haven't had it before. Um, for my academic background, you know, what I did was, was big data uh, coming, from, uh, coming from mobile phones. And specifically, I worked with uh, dozens of mobile phone operators around the world. And typically, it was operators actually in these developing countries. Operators who had neither the computational horsepower nor the human resources to deal with petabytes of data being generated about their subscribers. Um, and so I would go in and, um, for free, basically, help them analyze what's called CDR, call data records. I think Caroline might have talked a bit about this type of data before in the previous panel. Um, and what that, uh, you know, what that got them is they, they got some insight and about things like churn, people leaving their network. They'd be able to start figuring out a bit more about how to better market to their subscriber base. But what I got was some really interesting insights about how these countries and how these people tend to, tend to behave. Um, and, uh, and, and I started collecting data, you know, whether it was originally it was from England and then from Kenya, then the DR, and we started getting data from across Sub-Saharan Africa, from Southeast Asia, and, you know, building up a data set involving, you know, billions of people. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that gets, that gets really exciting because suddenly you can really start, you know, talking about, uh, about aggregate statistics of, of huge numbers of people and trying to figure out what's, what's really going on. Um, you know, so this is a brief overview of kind of what, kind of what CDR really represents. I mean, anything from phone calls to text messaging to when someone tops up their phone, this is all represented as a row in a database. Um, one of the, the interesting things, though, uh, you know, from my perspective, was starting to quantify patterns of behavior, you know, you know across cultures, across continents. Um, and, uh, and what was striking was how easy it is. You know, we are inherently as a species creatures of habit. You know, we fall into these routines. Um, and so parameterizing people with just a few variables is, is relatively trivial. Um, and so, you know, one of the variables we typically use was the idea that coming from statistical physics, radius of gyration. So it's, it's a parameter that can try to, you know, quantify how much people typically move on a daily basis. Um, you can think of it as your, your commute, for example. Um, and once you start quantifying these, these single, singular variables on a large population, you can start calculating them every day. And, um, and through a relatively simple st statistical procedure, you can actually start pulling out anomalies when people start deviating from that routine. And, um, you know, so I was working with uh, um, MTN in this case, which was, uh, you know, the, the, they had the majority of the, the market share in Rwanda. And so I had, you know, basically four years of data from virtually every mobile phone subscriber in the country. And um, in 2008, there was a, a pretty substantial earthquake in Rwanda. And what was interesting was that you can start just as, just as uh, Alice, uh, um, Alessio, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, uh, just as what we heard from the past, but from the Italian guy, 
um, about, about how, how we have these distributed sensors um, in our computers, you know, with these laptops. Um, what I was using was not that little accelerometer in your hard drive. I was using, um, you know, people's radius of gyration, people's typical movements, and looking at seeing if there is a deviation. Um, so you could think of um, now these sensors as people, you know, moving around, in this case, Rwanda. Um, and what was striking was, at the point of the earthquake, you know, a subset of the population substantially deviated from their normal behavior, right? Um, and this shouldn't be that surprising. Nor should it be surprising that the, the magnitude of the deviation corresponded directly to uh, the proximity to the epicenter, right? So you've got millions of little sensors, and, you know, now the variable that I'm interested in is this, the magnitude of deviation from a million data points. And what we were able to do, uh, and this is joint work with Eric Horvitz at Microsoft, was to, we, could, we could pinpoint the epicenter of that earthquake uh, within about 20 kilometers, using these millions of people and their behavior changes in response to that earthquake um, as, as the only data set they were using. Now, you know, there isn't a market, you know, or there isn't a huge market for um, um, after-the-fact earthquake detection, right? Um, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, there, there clearly is one, you know, there's, there's the reason why you're in the room today, right, for, for, for disease detection. Um, and so, you know, this got me starting to collaborate with the, the Ministry of Health in Rwanda, and they gave me a, a, a data set that was, you know, every cholera outbreak in the country, um, and the magnitude, I mean, the, the number of people that were uh, affected. And um, I started looking at, at the, the correlation, the kind of the, uh, between these, these two data sets, and um, the initial analysis made me fall off my chair. You know, what, it found, what I found was that um, I could predict you know, two weeks before the cholera outbreak would take place, I could, I could go out and, and identify a region that would, that would have that outbreak. Um, and you know, there's a reason why you know, this, this, I'm telling this example in the uh, failure section. Um, I mean, the lesson here is that an engineer should not be doing epidemiology in isolation. Um, uh, you know, w what I was pulling out was not cholera. You know, it was, it was a failure. I couldn't, I couldn't actually get the cholera, the, the predict that cholera signal. Does anyone have an idea of what, what I was pulling out? What, what signal would make people deviate from their behavior two weeks before a cholera outbreak? Yeah, what, what I built was a flooding detector. You know, people's roads were washing out, and, uh, and so their radius of gyration was decreasing. And, um, and that was not the onset of flu-like symptoms, right? That, that was just the fact that they, they were no longer as mobile as they once were because of the infrastructure. Um, and that's, I think, a kind of a lesson in where, you, where we do need to start thinking not just of people as particles, right? It's, it's really tempting when you've got a, a, you know, a sample size of a billion right, to parameterize individual, you know, idiosyncratic individuals with, with very few parameters and being able to start plotting straight lines on log-log plots. Um, and uh, and while I, I like that as much as the next guy, it's, um, I think it's really important to start, you know, getting beyond just that big data element and really starting to think about, well, how can we start, you know, what, you know how can we start in, incorporating the people that we're actually studying and, and getting their sense for what's actually going on? You know, you know, are, are, are you, uh, are, have you reduced your, your radius of gyration? Have you reduced your movement because you're feeling ill? Do you have a headache? Or, or is it because, you know, your car broke down or, you know, your road washed out? Um, so you really need to start bringing the human, you know, back into this type of modeling. Um, and um, so this is an example of when I tried to bring the human back into this type of modeling and it failed as well. Um, this was some, some work uh, that I was doing um, in a, uh, well, this, this, this actual, this project happened while I was uh, teaching at the University of Nairobi, but um, it was specifically, um, it was for this hospital, which I was spending a lot of time out in, in more rural Kenya. And um, when I first arrived at this hospital, uh, you know, actually maybe about three weeks after I arrived, this was actually one of the you know, few places that had air conditioning. And so I, I uh, was able to, you know, help out with some IT in exchange for sharing an office that was air conditioned. So I spent some time at this hospital, you know, hanging out. And when, in about, you know, three weeks into it, I got approached by this, you know, panicked nurse saying that there was a Matatu accident, 
you know, out on the road, and there was, you know, they desperately needed a blood, emergency blood transfusion. And the, and the local blood repository at the, at the blood bank in this rural hospital was depleted. And, um, you know, I have a phobia with needles, um, but, you know, when a panicked nurse approaches you in rural Africa about the fact that you need to give blood, you, you suck it up and you do it, and then you feel really heroic afterwards and show off, show off your bruise. Um, but then, uh, you know, about a month later, a, a different set of nurses approached me saying exactly the same thing. You know, there was this Matatsu accident, you, you know, we ran out of blood, the bank, we, needed, we needed transfusion immediately. Um, and when this happened the fourth time, you know, kind of out of my own self-interest more than anything else, I started looking into what's the deal with blood banks in, in, uh, in Kenya. And what it turned out was that there was this, um, you know, the way it worked was that there's this centralized blood bank in Mombasa um, that was supporting this particular hospital, and you'd have a guy in a pickup truck who would be doing circuits. And, um, and so he'd go from hospital to hospital in his district, and if the blood was below a certain threshold, um, he would, uh, you know, then take note of it, and then the next time when he went around, he would replenish the blood. Meaning, so you had a latency in the system of up to four weeks from uh, when, when, the, when, you know, you could run out to when ultimately you would be replenished. And, um, you know, that, that felt like a very inefficient system. And so together with some students of mine at the University of Nairobi, we built this uh, beautiful visualization, a nice, really nice front end um, um, that supported this, you know, basically text messaging. So letting the, the nurses text in what the current blood supply levels were. And this beautiful front end would then, the, the guys at the, and Mombasa would log in and see in virtually real time kind of what the blood supply levels were for a couple of these hospitals and, and more importantly, where the blood was needed. Um, and when we launched this thing, it, uh, you know, it, it generated a lot of press, at least you know, locally, um, and it seemed like a massive success. You know, the, the nurses were texting in the data, they had it properly formatted. Um, this, uh, this, this, you know, the guys at the blood banks were just logging in every five minutes trying to see if anyone had, you know, sent more data. Um, so, th you know, I felt very, uh, you know, proud of this kind of clever solution to, you know, stop having to provide blood. Um, but a, a week went by and, and about half the nurses stopped texting in the data. Um, and then after about a month from the time we launched that project, virtually no nurse was texting in any more data. Um, and, and the project failed. And, and the project failed not, not because of you know, tech, any technical shortcoming. I mean, technically, this thing was rock solid. Like we, we had engineered this thing to death, and, um, and it, 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 it really worked. Um, the, it failed because of a fundamental lack of insight on my part when we're starting to talk about bottom-up data collection, and when we're starting to talk about getting people to start giving you data. Um, because the channel that we're using, you know, the, the ubiquitous low-end mobile phone, you know, the SMS, um, ultimately was the wrong channel here. Um, well, at least it, it, we, we, we used it improperly. I mean, so what I failed to understand was that the price of a text message represents a relatively substantial fraction of a rural nurse's day's wage, right? By asking these individuals to send a text message every day with the uh, updated blood supply levels, you know, we were ultimately asking them to take a pay cut. You know, something that, that fundamentally wasn't fair. Um, and so that, that kind of led me you know, on to kind of, you know, well, how, how can we start going about making, making changes here and, and being able to properly implement a, a bottom-up data collection mechanism? Um, now, you know, one of the things, that, you know, the lessons that I learned while living in, in Kenya was that, uh, you know, I, I had to get a, a prepaid account. In fact, I tried to get a postpaid account, um, but they, you know, they, they didn't think I had good enough credit history. And so uh, I was stuck with prepaid, as was you know, well over 90% of the population of Kenya. And that's not just true of Kenya, that's true of almost every country. You know, so when I'm talking about those 6 billion mobile phone subscribers on the planet today, you know, you know, more than 5 billion of them are on, on prepaid. And one of the striking things about this kind of you know, prepaid market is that, you know, people tend to, to buy these scratch cards of airtime. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what's, what's interesting is that you're not buying minutes. You know, you don't go out to your store and buy like five minutes worth of airtime. Um, you, you, you buy, in this case, 100 Kenyan shillings, 
worth of, worth of air time. And um, while we were living in these, in these more rural areas, you could actually start using what Safaricom called a Sambaza, you know, setting, sending air time from one phone to another. And you know, to, to pay for our uh, produce at the local vegetable market, a, a vegetable market that had no electricity, you know, I would pay for you know, our vegetables with, with my mobile phone. This was like 2006, before, anyone, you know, before the word Google Wallet had uh, come out of anyone's lips. Um, so, you know, they were starting to use airtime as a surrogate for currency. And then, you know, that led into some other really interesting innovative mobile banking type applications. But fundamentally, airtime was cash. And, uh, and it, it's not just cash in Kenya, it's cash in most of the world. So, um, oh, and then, and then the, and the last thing I think, you know, when we're starting to talk about the mobile phone subscriber in these, in, in most of the world, like, uh, they, they spend on average anywhere between 8 to 12 percent of uh, a mobile sub phone subscriber's day's wage is spent on these scratch cards, right? So it's an extraordinary amount of spend uh, that, they, that, they, that they spend, relatively speaking. So um, actually, maybe I should, I should talk into, you know, the, the, to close the loop there, I, I was working with... Um, Michael Joseph, who was the CEO of Safaricom at the time, and I built this little airtime rewards platform uh, for, for his network um, to try to basically salvage this SMS blood bank system. You know, and so this little airtime reward platform, what it did is it let me send very small denominations of airtime to these rural nurses who are, who are texting in data. You know, ab about 10 cents, enough to compensate that individual for the price of the text message, and about a penny extra to just kind of say thank you. And, um, and that just flipped a switch, you know, and, and it led me to this realization that, boy, for, for cents, you can start incentivizing people to provide you all sorts of data, you know, not just data about what kind of the blood supply levels are, but, you know, it, you know we, like, who knows what we can start getting people to do and the information and insight we can start gleaning when we start incorporating people and not just incorporating them, but ultimately financially compensating them. Um, and so that little airtime, so I ended up leaving my, my academic job, um, and that, that, uh, that little airtime rewards platform that, uh, that I built for Safaricom, it's now been integrated into the back-end billing systems of over 230 mobile operators uh, across almost 100 countries. Um, and what that means is that we now have this massive database. You know, talk about, you know, big data. Now, you know, going from this bottom-up approach, you know, we now have um, access to, it's over 2.1 billion people. And we can not only communicate with these individuals, we can compensate them, and compensate them in denominations as, as low as 10 cents. And so, um, so that means we're now kind of rolling out surveys on a scale that I, I think the world has never seen. Um, and what we're finding is we're, we're failing again uh, on, uh, on, a, on a much larger scale and on a much larger stage. I mean, because um, when I left my job, I ended up uh, um, getting in bed with venture capitalists who've, you know, we've now raised close to $10 million, and suddenly the stakes are a lot higher than just getting your paper published. Um, but I think the failures are actually more interesting. Um, you know, so, you know, a lot, of our, a lot of our clients are trying to replicate, essentially, what they do in face-to-face -face surveys, you know, over the mobile phone. You know, whether it's... Um, you know, the, the WHO or Procter & Gamble, you know, or the UN for that matter, which is, uh, you know, someone that I was, we, we, an organization we've been working a lot with recently. I mean, they typically fly people out, you know, so if, take P&G, for example. If they want to know about what rural women think about laundry detergent, they'd, they'd literally fly, put people on a plane, fly them to Manila, rent Land Rovers, drive out into the field, and conduct face-to-face -face surveys, right? I mean, that is extraordinarily inefficient. And so, so why, why not be able to start pushing those surveys directly onto the handsets, compensating the rural women, you know, in airtime for their time? Um, and so when we started doing that, we started failing. And we failed because, you know, you can't put a 45-minute face-to-face survey on a, a phone that can display 100 characters at a time, right? Um, and so now kind of, you know, what we're trying to do is, is really start thinking about multiple choice, really, you know, very simple, simple types of surveys, and then driving people to other interfaces. You know, um, so, so Facebook has been huge for us. 
um, mobile web. I mean, we're now, we're now actually starting to explore the, um, that billing channel. So when people go out and uh, buy a scratch card, they type in the unique ID. They're actually not sending an SMS, but it's rather over something, a protocol called USSD. And so we've developed a wrapper called UCMP that tunnels through the USSD protocol. But the short story is that we can now deliver surveys um, through this, that billing channel. So just like people, when they're topping up their phone, um, they're, they're now filling out surveys as well, which is, which is pretty neat. Um, we're turning it into a self-serve platform, and, and that's the reason for this slide is that I, you know, really, my motivation is to open this up to the research community, right? To really be able to give, to, to be able to take a pulse on these underserved, understudied markets. Um, and we're slowly getting there, and so I'm, we're kind of doing initial, initial, you know, fun projects with, you know, organizations like the World Bank. Um, you know, Adam Davidson at NPR has been a great advocate for us, and so we did something for Planet Money where we're asking people, you know, what would you do with $15? And you get anything from buying a domain name to paying my dowry to, you know, buying perfume. Um, but it kind of highlights this, this, the powerful notion of being able to really go out and sample, you know, from a, a, a pool of two billion people. And, and that two billion hopefully will be three billion by the end of this year. So, um, you know, to wrap it up, you know, you know I, I think it's, you know, I, I love these types of events, right? I, I, I think uh, to some degree, I'm, I really am an engineer at heart. You know, there's the science of being able to start uncovering these, these underlying insights about how we as an aggregate behave right, you know, the, the passive observational science, right, of looking at movements of patterns and, and plotting those uh, straight lines on log-log plots. Um, but once we can start moving beyond, you know, passive observation and really start thinking about, you know, how can we leverage these insights? You know, we're starting to see all sorts of insights, you know, ranging from, you know, the, there's particular types of information that diffuse through a rural village in Kenya in very similar ways that it diffuses through a rural village in England. Or in the, you know, the mobility patterns in Rwanda look strikingly similar to how people move around the Dominican Republic, which bears some interesting parallels to how people move around the Bay Area. Um, but like, it's, you know, it can't be just about that, right? It can't be just about, you know, okay, well, we can, we can find some commonalities or identify differences. But ultimately, I think what we've got to be driving for is, is why, right? You know, why are we doing this? And, and, and I think there's, this type of data has just profound uh, has a profound potential to ultimately improve the lives of, of the people that are generating it. And, um, and we are just at the tip of the iceberg here. And so that's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for collaborators. If, if people are interested in this type of work, please, uh, please do get in touch, and I will uh, leave it at that. Thank you.